Welcome to another episode here at Lighting Board and another day of terrible lighting in my room. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, today we we will be talking to uh, George Gorton, um, who lives in the UK and he has uh, since 2016 been doing quite different things over the years, 3D artist, freelancing, and also uh, been a lead photogrammetry artist, which uh, uh, shamelessly I didn't know was a thing actually I thought like a 3d artist would normally do it but apparently there's a thing for it so I'm curious about that so I'm probably gonna ask him a little bit about that as well as usual if you have any questions feel free to ask them and we'll get started so let us please welcome uh, George Carton into the stream hello All right, I'm it. hey man how are you doing good thank you yeah happy to to be here thanks for inviting me on this so I remember you said you're not the morning person. When do you normally wake up? <laughs> oh man, well I have to wake up in the mornings for work, but uh, still doesn't mean I'm a morning person, you know. <laughs> That's good. Uh, before I we get to. too stuck into it, by the way, I did want to uh, thank you for all the work you you do on this Lightbox community. So, oh uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, normally people thank me in private, but you did it just in live stream. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, honestly, I really appreciate it. So when I was first getting into lighting up, this was uh, one of the things that came up and it was really helpful because it's quite difficult to find kind of like up to date information on lighting art in such a, like a huge volume that you've collected all into. So, uh, yeah. Oh, well, um, didn't know. Uh, I had some a minor impact in your uh, decisions. That That's always good to know that uh, that it's working. That makes me happy to know, you know, it's, it's people are making use of it because you know no no one leaves a comment so you don't actually know if it's working so yeah i appreciate it that's kind of you uh but today it's about you george <laughs> <laughs> so george you have been up to a lot of things over the years since uh, 2016 at least according to linkedin you've probably done other stuff that's unrelated before uh, which is always fun to hear about as well uh, i think uh, that's always fun um let's talk a little bit about your um, journey so far um by the way, you started, funny enough, when I double-checked LinkedIn uh, while you were talking earlier, you actually started with cinematography and film video production uh, in 2011. Um, so you were already interested in kind of cinematography and film video or, or what happened? Because you got to programming apparently afterwards and then you went to 3D. So you have done quite a few switches over the years just during uh, studies. Let us talk a little bit about those changes and those, um, you know, those journey first. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, being a bit all over the place, really. Um, so just to explain all that, like my main goal has always been to make my own video game. So I've kind of been learning all the different avenues of, of that that I can. But uh, yeah, to begin with, uh, growing up where I did near Glastonbury in Somerset, there wasn't like a lot of game uh, like college courses or anything. So the closest I could get was a uh, film, film and media course. So that's what I studied to begin with and found that I had like a, a massive love for the sort of creative industry and making videos and, you know, cinematography side of those things. But games has always been my, my kind of one true love. So. I eventually found a college course like a bit further out, like an hour away from where I was living or something. And I went and did that, but that was one of these big overall courses that has a bit of art, a bit of programming, a bit of design, you know, a bit of everything. And after doing that, I found out that I really, really enjoyed the 3D art side of that course. So I actually only did like one year of that and then went on to a proper university art course that specialized in just that and I remember finding out about that and thought oh my god it's incredible like a, a course that is dedicated to just art just like the one module that I enjoy from like this whole thing so uh yeah I thoroughly enjoyed going and studying that that's cool so would you say you got what you needed out of your education before you started jumping around and and working because you were studying and doing freelance a bit before, according to your um, LinkedIn anyway, you did the uh, studies and you've studied finished in 2018, but you were already doing freelancing um, between, I guess, maybe type of uh, modding type of freelancing, I would assume. Uh, yeah, yeah. 2016 and before you joined Bullcat as a junior in my mind, 2017, but that was still when you were studying. Is that correct assumption? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So like did a, a little bit of freelancing, but that was only like very minor stuff like you said, but for modding just to kind of basically have something on my cv at that point when you're like 
super like graduate kind of level. Um, and then in my second year of uni, I went to EGX Resd in London. Um, which we did like every year as the uni course, but in the second year went around and doing the normal thing of talking to different developers, seeing that what they've got going. And there was one developer there, which was Bulkhead, who I went and spoke to another. I was actually just going there to like play their game, but a friend of mine happening, happened to be talking in the queue about my work and they're like, oh, you're an artist. Can we, can we have a look at some of your work? And I showed it to them. They seemed quite keen on it. And then went inside and had a talk with uh, like their CEO and everything. And uh, turns out they had a position open. So they offered it to me kind of there and then if I, if I could get to where they were based in Derby and they had to move in about two or three weeks. Um, but yeah, I was gonna, it was like a position over the summer because I knew I was a student and you would be going back to uni for my third year. But uh, between my second and third year, I went and spent the summer working for them, which was extremely valuable experience. Like really mm. helped, helped my career. I think the mooding thing is part of it because uh, I don't think I have met anyone else yet who has mentioned they did modding uh, initially, um, except myself, because I did the same thing when I started out. I was doing modding while I was a student together, I had, uh, which I do recommend for everyone is to already get started in and modding and communities, really. Um, how was your experience doing the modding part? Is that did it benefit you at all or did, was it just a waste of time the, the few months you did it? or? Uh, it certainly wasn't a waste of time. I think when you're at that that level, that sort of graduate, like pre-graduate level, and you're seeing all these job applications that are like asking for experience, you're like, how the hell do I get experience for this? You know, if I'm a junior, I'm a graduate, or whatever. I think the modding stuff can really help because I mean, maybe there's some uh, leads out there who wouldn't consider that proper experience, but I, I definitely consider it more than nothing. So if you show that you've worked. Uh, in, in a team, you've worked somewhat collaboratively and you've done work that's kind of got to be done to somewhat of a deadline. And, it, you know, it could be really, really relaxed stuff. But if it's just something to prove you've done that, I think that can really help to show you've got like at least a little bit of experience and kind of propel you up there a bit. Yeah. And obviously you have done a little bit of 3D artists or material artist at the Sumo Digital as well. Uh, how has that helped you? so far in terms of suddenly switching to senior lighting artists because we've done uh, lead photography to artists let's talk a little bit about that journey quickly and kind of understand what brought you back to bulkhead which you were originally a junior environment artist at artist at which was your first uh, formal uh, job to begin with and you just kind of made a full circle like i would say uh, on where you started and uh, where you are now um, yeah what happened? What happened? You, you have different education um, that, you know, doesn't necessarily directly connect um, on first glance. And then you have different work experience that doesn't necessarily correct, uh, connect in first glance. What made you suddenly decide, OK, I'm going to try this and do this and this. And you just woke up one day, 20, 22 January, say, OK, mm -hmm. I'm going to become a senior lighting artist, completely different skill set and experience. Uh, so and, yeah. So uh, when I went to Sumo, I joined as a junior artist, uh, but then quite quickly they were looking for a material artist and my friend happened to put me forward for the role because I was at that point the only person in the company, the new substance designer. Um, so at uni, I'd been kind of experimenting with different softwares that came up and substance was relatively new at that point. And I was beginning to learn that because I was like, oh, this is quite cool. And it seems like a fast way of doing things compared to like the old Photoshop workflow. <laughs> So that really helped me just you know, learning new up and coming software that maybe other people are a bit more unfamiliar with. So when I was at Zoom, I got put forth for that material art role and they're like, well, yeah, we can at least, you know, let George have a crack at it. And if, you know, if he's not good at it, then we'll actually hire one, but it saved them the trouble of having to hire one initially. Um, and I guess I must have done something right because they kept me as one for, for a year and a half. Um, and that really, uh, I think it's really helped me with lighting art as well to learn quite in depth about materials and how they react to light, things like that. It was also during my time at Sumo that I was working with uh, Kontan Papalu, if I pronounced his last name correctly, who was uh, the lighting artist at Sumo at that point on Sackboy with me. Uh, I think he's now at Blizzard or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, really talented lighting artist and just seeing the work that he was doing uh, on Sackboy was quite inspiring to me. And I was like, that's really cool. At that point in my career, I didn't sort of fully know exactly 
what a lighting artist even kind of did. I knew what lighting was in terms of environment art, but I didn't know specifically what like a, a lighting artist was was doing. And I was quite interested. And I remember asking him a few times about different things and began working on lighting specific scenes around that time. Um, but then after that point, uh, I went off and that's when I did some freelance work over in Canada because I, <laughs> I just had a, I always wanted to go and do snowboarding, like a snowboarding season. And an opportunity came up to go do that in Canada. So I was like, well, I might as well go take this. I've been at this company for a year and a half. I've got that like experience as a junior now and or as I go into like a mid-level now. And with that experience, it should be easier for me to find other jobs in the future so I can afford to kind of go off and do this whole like snowboarding thing that I wanted to do for, for so long. So yeah, that's what I went and did. Moved to Canada and did that. All right, so there's a bit, a bit of back and forth. Uh, how was it getting into Canada? By uh, so a lot of people would ask, like, okay, what's the visa process and and to, like oh, was that? Yeah, that was that took a while. <laughs> that took probably like, the best part of a year of going through and uh, getting all the paperwork in order and like so many different things you have to do and you have to like contact the police department to prove you've not got a criminal record and get all this other like paperwork in order and all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, eventually we got it all through and uh, I got a, I went there with my friend and we got a two year working visa in Canada and I didn't actually have any plans for it. I just kind of was like, right, I got the visa and we'll get the flight to go over there and uh, hopefully make a living out there somehow. So that's what we went and did. I think we stayed in the hostel for a little bit and uh, looked for an apartment. Eventually got like kind of settled and then I was like, yeah, doing a lot of the snowboarding throughout the day and then it's like oh yeah i need some money to pay for rent now so i could go and get like a job doing whatever else but i thought i've got these skills behind me i might as well try and use that and that's when i first started trying to get into like more freelance kind of contract type work because i still wanted to be doing what i wanted to do throughout the day like at the end at the end of the day i was mainly going there for the snowboarding but i wanted to at least get some money rolling in to cover rent and bills and stuff okay. so uh yeah, I was lucky to come by this uh, kind of contract work for Improbable doing sort of like prop art, environment art, that was it's kind of weird the way it was done because usually these things get paid on a daily rate basis, whereas this you're getting paid on like a per asset basis, which was not great, but it was better than nothing. Um, and it meant that I could snowboard during the day and then do like a little bit of freelance work in my evenings or whenever I had like a rest day from snowboarding so it, it worked out fine even if it wasn't the most well paid thing or whatever cool <clears throat> funny question though if you could pick making money being in snowboarding than what you're doing now would you pick snowboarding or would you pick game industry oh man can i, can I choose both okay <laughs> i i've never really cared much about like the money side of things i'd much rather be like enjoying myself and doing what i love doing so if it came to like would i rather have like a super well-paid job and not be able to do like some of the hobbies i really enjoy or a not super well-paid job but get to enjoy the hobbies i love i would definitely choose the latter and have all those fun hobbies and do all that and as long as i can get by that's all i'd need the last last person asked this uh was into climbing and he said the climbing mm. that's fair i like climbing too yeah like bouldering stuff seems a lot of people in the games industry are into like bouldering and climbing whatever reason but yeah because yeah, you're in front of the computer all the time so eventually you realize you need to go do something else as well and then you find something you like and you do it um i don't have any particular i switch a lot so i go from like photography to painting and normally mm. unconsciously has to benefit my work as well so i'm like trying to get out of that uh psychology eventually but you were eventually you eventually became a lead photography artist. So what happened there from 3D to boom, lead photography artist? That's a quite a jump and quite a change. What happened? Why did it happen? And how did you do it? Uh, so during like the freelancing stuff, uh, I did more of that and eventually had to come back to the UK because of the whole pandemic kicking off and everything. Um, but I came back and was lucky to get some more freelance stuff back in the UK and one of them was like a bit more of a senior kind of role. It's, it's weird. It was like a, a consultancy, 3D consultancy sort of role, which is quite interesting, but it was uh, for a company that perhaps maybe hadn't delved as far into like game development stuff as, as other ones had done. And they just wanted the help of someone with like real time experience to help guide them in that process. So that's what I did. And I think that more sort of senior level stuff kind of helped and 
I got contacted by uh, the company Happy Mushroom through my art station for the lead photogrammetry artist role, um, which was mainly because I had a bit of photogrammetry on my portfolio, which was like super old. I didn't think it was like a massive, like awesome thing that I was even considering maybe taking off because it was quite old, but um, they saw that and it showed I had experience with that particular workflow. And in my, my resume, my CV, I've discussed about whilst being a material artist at Sumo, that I was kind of managing one of our teams out in India, because again, like substance design was quite new. So I was the only material artist in house and we had some of our other artists like external working on it. So I kind of review their work and give them feedback on materials and help them with like the shaders and what they do and all these kind of things. So that kind of like semi management stuff mixed with my like photogrammetry experience um, and just all the other experience was enough to, uh, for them to offer me the, the role of the lead photogrammetry artist, which was quite a big jump. And I was quite apprehensive at first. I was like, oh God, am I, am I ready for this? Um, but apparently I, I, I was, I, I enjoyed it and they really liked me there. So, um, yeah, it just goes to show that sometimes something like that comes along and you may not think you're ready for it. A bit apprehensive about it like it's always worth giving these things a go because i mean what's the worst that could happen you know the absolute worst that could happen is that i maybe don't do too well and it's not quite for you but hey at least you gave it a go and then and then you know that from that point so yeah so so our um company we are looking into photogrammetry actually do you have any tips advice on workflow or, or something like easy you can say at the moment that like something we should work out for when it comes to doing photogravity and simplifying uh, that kind of uh, workflow basically i mean the 3d team is also looking into it a lot but maybe you know a couple of things that i would say <laughs> save us time yeah i mean there's a lot of information online about it now so there's a lot you can sort of read up on on the sort of the perfect workflows of doing everything but you know it's like the basics of trying to quite a flat lighting setup when you're capturing uh, your your objects and trying to have like the highest quality sort of camera that you can like the higher megapixel the better in the photogrammetry um, and then try and get as much overlap between each shot as you can so I think we're going for about 70% overlap with each of our images um, I mean the stuff we're doing is something like very high quality because it was like for film and all that uh, yeah, there's, there's loads of stuff online. And, and, and is there specific softwares or something that you would recommend that you tried that was like worth? Yeah, so Reality Capture is probably like the, the go-to one for getting like the highest quality captures, and it's really fast as well. It's also really expensive, but uh, I've come down a little bit since like Epic acquired them. But I think yeah, reflection that's... specs is like one of the issues a lot of people have when they do it. But I guess it comes down to lighting and the material of the object, obviously. Yes, yeah, so there's a few ways you could tackle that. Like yeah, there's lighting. Um, there's also like a polarizing filter that you can put on the end of the camera that can help minimize like specular. Um, you can sometimes spray your uh, object with a certain like kind of like weird paint thing that's like makes it a bit more matte. Um, but that kind of can mess with the, the actual base color a bit sometimes. But if you're just using it to maybe get like a reference for an object, and then you could like later sculpt that properly in ZBrush or something, it can be good for doing that route. Um, but yeah, cool. it can be a bit difficult to. We'll have a conversation in the future about it too. Uh, things that I probably need to know for the current stuff I'm doing. Um, yeah, there's a lot of other stuff behind it as well, like not just the kind of capturing software, but um, or how you capture it, but also how you process the the raw like data sets, like the images, because um, that can help a lot with uh, trying to make those images as flat as possible. So. It's funny because when you usually do like art stuff, you, you want to try and create contrast in your images, but with photogrammetry with these images, it's all about reducing contrast and trying to make the image as flat as possible. So you'd be like there in um, Photoshop or whatever you're using and like reducing or increasing the shadows and reducing the highlights and all those kind of things to really kind of like flatten out a bit. Um, and then there's like the processing side of it. Uh, another one is Gigapixel. They make really good uh, software. What's it called again? Uh, Gigapixel AI. That's really good for like, upscaling stuff to get like even higher res textures out of your photogrammetry stuff. But, uh, yeah, nice. there's a ton of stuff for it. A quick shout out to Amit for watching. Thank you, Amit. Amit, 
says Hamid. Hello, Hamid. To Hamid Hello, from Hamid. Hamid. <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate the comment, Hamid. Thank you, Hamid, from Hamid again. <laughs> so, <laughs> not Hamid. So, uh, George, um, you had something you wanted to share, like a kind of um, input. I mean, we obviously have a younger uh, audience actually watching today, so it might actually be suitable to go through it. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, I've got this presentation that uh, I was going to share with you. We've kind of gone through like some of it already just in talking, but we could uh, we go through it and see if there's anything useful in there for. for we can keep the slide open and we can just pick it as a topic as we go, I suppose. Yeah, sounds good. Do a new right. style of presentation. Two people don't know. One person knows the talk, the other person has no idea what it's about, and we just gonna go with it. <laughs> All right, I'll uh, share my screen of what I've got here then. <clears throat> screen one hopefully my weird like, resolution won't mess things up too much as long as you don't have an SDR screen no I'd love to get one though that'd be great it doesn't right. work on the streams normally at least on Discord it's a problem when people are doing it they have to go on a regular screen to see it right well uh, skip through my journey a bit because we just kind of covered all that but uh yeah, but why don't you mention the responsibilities? Because not everyone actually know it, and I don't necessarily repeat it every time. But since you have a slide for it, let's hear it. Yeah, yeah, I thought we'd be good to go through the actual responsibilities of the lighting artist. Because when I first sort of was an art 3D artist, I did, like I said, I didn't actually know exactly what a lighting artist even did. So it can be useful for some people to, to know a bit about that. Uh, so, and this is all from my personal experience. It may differ from you know, your experience or, or whatever, but in my experience, it's, uh, I work quite closely with the art director achieve the, the overall visual aesthetic of the game. Um, you have a lot of say in like the, the overall look and, and mood of, of what you're working on, which is something I really enjoy working on, particularly like in all my scenes, I've always enjoyed establishing mood and atmosphere, and that's a big part obviously, of lighting. Um, it's quite similar to that of a cinematographer or director of photography in the film industry too, which is uh, another main reason that I got into lighting art, which was Aside from seeing the lighting artists work at Sumo, it was also during my role as a lead photogrammetry artist because you're asking how those, how that links in with me becoming a lighting artist. So when I was working in the film industry, uh, I was lucky to work uh, under uh, the cinematographer Bill Pope, who I didn't work like a lot with, but I saw him working in some of the like sort of shoots and stuff that we did, and just he's the cinematographer of the Matrix, the first few Matrix films, which I absolutely adore. But seeing him work and just seeing why he was doing certain things and he's like, oh, can we have like the light over here and have the people here and have like move that thing over here and just like he was moving all these different things around in the scene and hearing why he wanted to do all that. I was just like really fascinated that like all these little things and like the angle of the light and the color and the, the framing of the shot and all these little things could really like drastically change how the audience perceives it. Uh, I just found it absolutely fascinating. I think that for me was a big kind of turning point where I was like, this is something I really want to go and pursue. But, um, you know, as much as I enjoyed the film industry, I wanted to be back in the games industry because that was you know, my, my, like my one true, my first love. Uh, and I was like, well, what would be the role of a cinematographer in the games industry? I thought like the closest thing to that is, is like a lighting artist where you play that sort of role of director of photography and establishing mood and feel of different scenes. So yeah, that was one of the main inspiring moments for me to becoming a lighting artist. Nice. Uh, yeah, experiment different like scenarios, color schemes, and then also, yeah, optimization. That is also a big part. It can get quite technical being a lighting artist in some cases. So it can help to have that knowledge I found. And leading on from that, the skills, our fundamentals is a big one. That was something I think I struggled a little bit with because I've never actually had like a proper, like a uh, fine art kind of background. Like when I was at college, we were talking earlier and I was studying film and media and stuff like that. I didn't actually study the sort of core art fundamentals. So that was something I've had to learn throughout my journey of becoming an artist was you know, things like color theory, composition and shape language, all that stuff that Perhaps a lot of people have like learned from quite an early point. That's something I had to really like brush up on and learn more about because that obviously plays a huge role in lighting art. 
um, environment, the PBR, that's always good to have, you know, how materials are going to react to your lighting, which is how uh, my role as a material artist really helped me to get to where I am. And yeah, more like technical kind of stuff. So yeah, that can differ depending on what job you're working on, what engine you're using, you're using like bait lighting, dynamic lighting, or some like weird other thing, like, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, film cinematography, I think you were asking earlier about like resources for learning more about lighting. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people that come on uh, your, your podcast before have spoken about like various books and um, game related stuff to help with lighting. And uh, those have been really, really useful. I think I've actually taken some of that into account and looked at that myself. But one thing that I found really useful for myself is actually studying a bit more about film and cinematography because that's an older industry. You know, film is what, like at least like a hundred years old or so. And you've got a lot of history there to learn about. And, and a lot of it is very transferable, especially now that games are so like photorealistic. A lot of those uh, rules or, or like things that cinematographers have learned throughout their time apply quite a lot to games. So it can be quite useful to look up on film and how they've tackled certain things and how you could apply that to games. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, appeals of lighting art. Yeah, a lot of creative freedom and expression, which I really enjoy in like you know, developing that mood of the scene. You, you, your director could be like, oh, we want to try and establish this particular scene or mood. And like you go away and you experiment with different like color schemes, different color palettes and moving things around, getting a different like you know, long shadows or like a more sort of like flatter image or like all, all these different things to like uh, really get that mood that you're going for. And I love that. It's like a, a huge amount of creative freedom. Like you can drastically change the entire scene, the entire feel of like a whole map or level or whatever just by obviously. You know, so I sometimes life. ask people um, this, I suppose is a difficult question and it's a tricky question I suppose as well. This, Mm. Do you think lighting is easier? Because uh, I, I noticed your slide says modeling and texture is a bit tedious. So a lot mm. of people that get into a lot of people I talk to that want to get into lighting, they they think it's they think it's easier and it's like a shorter route, and then think it requires less skills and less understanding. Where do you stand in that? Considering you've done a couple of other roles and responsibilities up until now. So I definitely wouldn't say it's easier, but my kind of point with with that particular bit was um if you're into 3d art but you find that maybe you're not enjoying the modeling so much or even like the texturing so much and you're kind of like well what's going on here i really like like the the creative side of 3d art but like i'm just not quite feeling it with modeling and texturing like what, what else can i can i do um well that can be where lighting could be really really handy because you know you're, you're doing a lot of the the, the creative impact on the game the, you know, I, I personally spent like a lot of time in the engine, just you know, changing things around and um, doing the modeling and texturing. I, I do a little bit of that, but like not nearly as much. And I have really enjoyed doing that in the past, but I quite like a lot of variety. So it's good to, to do this as a bit, of, add a bit of difference to it, but I wouldn't say it's any easier. It's just different and might appeal to a certain type of person. So what did you say to people who are thinking it might be easier that it your conclusion is for someone who has done different roles that it's not necessarily easier you shouldn't be picking this work solely based on the fact that it's an easy easy way to get into the job industry you would still consider it, it takes effort and knowledge mm. and certain skill sets to do it properly and, and well done basically yeah yeah i definitely wouldn't consider it like an easy way and in fact i i'd say it's probably one of the more difficult ways in because I found that it's quite a, a fairly high level role because you have so much control over the scene. You know, if you were to join really early on as like an environment artist and you were kind of inexperienced and you're just sort of learning the ropes and stuff, and maybe your first few assets aren't like super amazing, they could likely just be like a tiny little box in the corner or something else that like isn't going to get seen that much by the player. So it's not like that detrimental from the company's perspective. Whereas if you're joining as a lighting artist, you've got a lot more say over like the entire game and the feel of certain levels. So, you know, if your like skills weren't quite as up to scratch as much, it's probably a bit more noticeable. So 
that could be why you also don't see as many junior lighting artist positions as you might see like junior 3D artist positions. Okay, cool. Uh, moving on to tailoring your portfolio. Um, I think it's always good to have a piece like a kind of almost environment art type piece just to show that you've got an understanding of an environment art uh, sort of principles and that you, you could do like basic modeling and texturing, which you know is sometimes required in lighting art. If you've if you've got like a particular thing you're trying to convey to your team, or you're like, oh, I need this like source of lighting, but like it maybe it's a sort of a weird particular shape, a weird certain like emissive you're going for, or whatever you're, you're trying to achieve, it can be quite good to be able to just like quickly model that out, whack it in the engine, or even like do some real quick dirty textures, just to like get a rough idea to the team of what you're looking for. So I think it can really help to have that understanding. And also to understand what your team are doing and how you could maybe help them in achieving the overall goal that you're going for. Because you might know what you're going for and the art director has an idea of what you're going for, but you can help try and tie that between the, like the, the environment artists and the prop artists and stuff. And like, ah, oh, can we have like a this certain shape coming from this piece that you're making to help sort of push this particular composition we're going for? Can we have like some more negative space on this like asset that you've made so I can maybe put some like lights in there or like you know, things like that? Um, and relights, yeah, like everyone always has some sort of like relights on their, their lighting portfolio. Though I, I personally say to maybe try and avoid some of the really like famous or like really like well done uh, relights where you've just like there's certain scenes that have just been like relit loads like it can be fun to try and like try it out if you've got like an idea of something really like different that you're going for but if it's a well-made scene and it's been like relit quite a lot and, and especially relit by you know like a lot, a lot of talented people um then that can sometimes be a bit like people might compare it too much so just be be wary of that and maybe go for something a bit more unique um, create your own scenes from asset packs. That's always good. Um, and also maybe just try character lighting as well. That can be, that can be a bit different. Um, you know, it can give you something new to, to try. That's kind of something I was going for. This piece actually was a little bit of character lighting, just as a bit, bit variety to the usual environment art stuff that I go for. Makes sense. Um, hi, Luke Skywalker, thank you for tuning in um, as usual. <laughs> <clears throat> so um with the uh the stuff you've done so far and uh, i think it's good advice that i i normally don't tell my students to do any custom environment unless they already know or their way around then i might say let's keep one but normally i try and get them started for motivational reason just to do the lighting because the people mm. do this motivation quite easily uh, and uh, if the first thing I ask them is to make an environment and they don't know how to do it, then it's like completely learning curve. Um, so uh, that's probably is, is, is the main difference there. Other than that, I think it's uh, quite good to have different pieces, different moods. And I, I definitely agree if, if, if the piece has been done quite a few times, don't touch it unless you're really sure that you're doing it uniquely, because that's an advantage. Because if a piece has been done many times and you do it differently, recruiters will notice that this piece is the same piece as everyone else, but it's done in such a good way, in a different way, that's definitely going to be a pro, but otherwise it's just definitely a con uh, if it's just yeah. a, just the same thing, basically. Absolutely, uh, yeah, I completely agree. So I agree with you on that one. So what would you say so far is is some advice for people to get started, though? Because uh, you mentioned the kind of indirect cinematography and Watch, learning from movies, buying some books, um, but you've been doing it things over time slowly and kind of picking up things slowly over time. So it's obviously a bit harder, I would assume, to kind of digest down and think about what is it that made you competent enough to get started. But you did jump quite quickly to senior lighting artists, which is not as common. Most people, mm -hmm. regardless of the background, they start as a junior and then maybe after a year, they, they prove themselves and then become a senior at, at the quickest. So so what's the key difference that made you uh, quickly jump into a senior lighting artist position? What is it that you prove, think you've proven or, or illustrated during your interview or even an art test if you did that? Uh, so I think that 
you know, I've been dabbling in lighting here and there since I was a material artist at Sumo, and I had a, a couple of things in my portfolio to show that. And then also working in film itself, and like I was saying before about like um, looking how like, a cinematographer would, would, would do things in engine, I think I learned quite a lot through that. And then I just spent a lot of time um, researching lighting art and reading like a I have got like a book and looking at stuff that you've got as well and just some videos on YouTube and all that kind of stuff just trying to learn as much as I could about it and then when it came to uh, the interview for, for Bulkhead um, that was I think at that point in my career I was like okay I'm comfortably like at a sort of senior artist level so whatever I kind of go into next whether it be back into environment art or whatever it would be like I'd like to be looking for a kind of senior artist position in that um, I think overall maybe that's where I was going with that but like my just overall experience felt like I'd, I'd been brought to like a senior position and so going into lighting again it was like a little bit um a bit like going into being like a lead photogrammetry artist it was I was a bit apprehensive at first because I was sort of like oh am I am I really ready for this you know but I've tried to be like that for every position I go into like that might make some people a bit nervous but I quite enjoy that because it means I'm learning something new and I'm going into a sort of new era I'm going to learn a, a lot of stuff from it so if I feel a bit like am I really ready for this it's actually probably a good thing so I went into this current position with that in mind and uh yeah I just explained my, my previous experience to the guy interviewing me and he saw some of my work and seemed pretty happy with where I was at and also I think at, at this uh the bulk of they really um, value the variety of skills and knowing how to do like lots of different things so my experience with material art environment art photogrammetry and all that is is really really valuable to them so i think it's helped me in becoming where i'm at today but it was, it's quite a lot to learn to begin with i think jumping from having never sort of officially worked uh, as, as a lighting artist i mean i've worked on a few of the, the contract pieces i did a few of the freelance stuff some of that I did do a bit of lighting on. So I had done a, a little bit of lighting um, experience at a sort of maybe kind of mid-level. Um, right. But you're jumping straight into it as a senior was, was quite uh, quite a lot. But I just try my best to learn as much as possible and uh, learn as much from the artists around me and other lighting artists that I'd be working with. And just that that really helped a lot, actually. So you're working with other lighting artists, artists as well, and, and they've been probably doing it a bit longer than you, I'm assuming. Yeah, 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 exactly. So they, they've got some fantastic experience that's uh, been really valuable to me. So yeah, reach so, out to the rest of your team always helps. I noticed one thing with the, it was a bulkhead, it's called, the studio. Mm, yeah. They have a four-day work week or something. Oh, yeah, that, that that's glorious. I love that. <laughs> so how does that work and how does that relate to, get, to getting a fair pay as well when you're just working four days a week? How does that work? Uh, the pay is the same um, and you, you just work for like eight hours um, from Monday to Thursday. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it works really, really well. I, I enjoy it. It's, it's only a trial thing at the moment, uh, but yeah, it's been going on for a few months and I think everyone's really, really happy about it. It helps reduce burnout, definitely. You know, when you're working throughout the week and get to Friday, it can be a bit like, oh, God, I'm using all my creative energy. But with the four-day work week, it, it helps a lot to sort of maintain that throughout the week and just sort of kind of give it your all each day, I, I find. But it gives uh, people uh, an extra day to do other stuff. But I, I think for some people, it also gives a day to upskill on their own and keep up with things as well because you have, like, technically an extra day off you could still say it's kind of like a volunteer research development day that you can decide and then you have the weekends afterwards depending on your discipline yeah. obviously um, yeah that's how i personally kind of use it is also you know, i'll work from monday to thursday and then friday i'll spend uh, maybe my portfolio or just doing a bit of research and doing my own stuff and then have the weekend to relax and do whatever yeah, it makes sense. We have an interesting question, which I am not sure how to answer, but we'll, we'll, we'll uh, go for it. Uh, one question, what is the upcoming AI role in our lighting industry? So I'm assuming the question is, is there something we think that will be automatic? Uh, okay. To, and 
in a sense, you could say that Lumens is already doing it in the sense that yeah. it's easier to do stuff. And, and uh, let's just talk, discuss that a little bit. What are your thoughts on um, the AI part of the lighting industry become more automatic? And what do you think that might be, if anything? <clears throat> yeah, that's an interesting one, I guess. Because like in terms of environment art, you've got some interesting AI stuff on the horizon where... Um, I don't know what it's called, but there's those things where you can like uh, drag into the engine and it'll create like a whole little scene for you based on like what you type. So you could type like, I don't know, so sunset campfire and then it'll like put down all the different assets for, for a campfire and like you know, a tent and all these kind of things. So it sort of, like helps the, the set dressing aspect quite a bit using AI. So I'm not sure how that would fit into lighting as well, but I suppose if they've already got that in place, there could well be technology down the line where it's as simple as of typing in what kind of basic atmosphere or mood you're going for and the engine will do its best to try and convey that so if you just like type in i don't know like a scary foggy nighttime like kind of sun hill type thing it'll it'll do that for you um or type in like a sort of beautiful quiet sunset it could do that as well and save a little bit of time in setting those things up how i see it going yeah i mean and some of the studios I worked at, uh, but that outsourcing and freelancing at full time. Uh, I wouldn't say it was an AI base, but it was definitely automatic in the sense that they would, um, in dialogue scenes and conversational scenes, they would just use three point lighting as a, a principle and they would, they would automate the lights. So you wouldn't have to light every dialogue in every conversation. It would just be boom. Uh, default uh, setup that I would be linked in and only if it didn't end up correctly would you then be assigned to go in and fix it basically yeah uh, yeah I think um, the thing that I was on about I just found it here is called Promethean AI I think that's what I was talking about where it like creates all the scenes for you based on what you sort of type in or oh, yeah. say in the art now which is kind of mad I, I, I did download it, but didn't really get into trying it out. But it definitely looks interesting uh, to see that um, Promethean AI. I remember that one. I think a friend of mine, he was using it a little bit and experimenting with it. So that's how I got into knowing about it too. But I think with the, what I do think might happen with the lighting industry is as we, as more and more people are educated and learn more about um, realistic lighting values so proper lumens value pro proper exposure proper these things that i teach in my course as well i think as more as more that gets streamlined i think similar to what we did i think it was at ubisoft we would predefine all the lighting ahead of time so this is the range this is how it looks so this is the default i imagine eventually it would be possible to predefine the distance and the environment and so okay that's the size there's the room this is the size so the light just places there and this is the default lighting that's going to happen because of the scale of the room based on real values and real um room size and things like that so it's kind of get automatic and then the artist will go in and kind of tweak it according to mood and, and story more than anything and we do it kind of already with the lumens kind of um showing out shooting out all the indirect lighting as opposed um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um interesting. You brushed upon like physic, uh, physical act uh, based uh, values for for lighting. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting. Do you think that so you're saying that's something that you teach in your stuff? Is that something that uh, you'd say is like the way forward? That that's like how we should kind of be doing all our lighting from now. And is there any reason to be doing it otherwise? Or what's your view on that? I mean. I think uh, it is going to be a good baseline because if an art director tells you to change the light, normally what most people would do, they change one light, but they have to change everything else as well normally. Uh, yeah. With my method and the way I teach in my courses, you change normally the exposure first and that would change everything in that environment basically. And if that doesn't work, only then do you go in and tweak the light. But normally it's not about tweaking the light. It's normally about, okay, if a light source, it's a, if a fluorescent light, generally will have 1,000 to 2,000 uh, lux normally. Uh, and, and if you know that, that's the intensity that you have, and then you will decide the range of it, right? What most people do, they'll increase the intensity in the range of the light to get it to look the way they want to. But in reality, that's not how it works. In reality, you have a fixed lumens and it goes a specific way. In the square law, it never stops. But obviously, because you said in your presentation, the game optimization, so it has to stop eventually. So then instead of touching the light anymore and 
messing with the physical correct value the way i teach it that you add more lights and you learn how to add more lights correctly or like in my room i have one two three four five six seven eight i have um eight spotlights uh, to to light my room basically and if one goes off it's very obvious that it's getting dark in in one corner of my room um so i think uh yeah it's definitely a, a more optimized way of working and then you do the stylized stuff afterwards um do i think it's going to replace anything no i don't think it's going to replace anything i do not personally i'm not too specific on it i just teach it because i had to learn it from someone else and he had to help me make the course as well and he had to go through everything as well and then because of my pedagogic approach to things and my other skill set and painting i combined the knowledge basically in a more artistic way too um and then uh, yeah it's definitely useful and i think it's more useful for our exterior scenes i think it's useful for interior scenes because people most lighting artists that are beginners that i see do lighting add just random light they they just go with the flow but i think you need both i think you need to understand yeah. it and then have the artistic eye to override it and go okay this doesn't suit the mood what do we do um and it minimizes your workload i mean how annoying it just yeah. imagine a big level and you have to change 50 lights that's too much work uh, so my method kind of uh, minimize that uh, you don't have to sit there and tweak and go to the art director every time you can do it quite quickly and with my art director i can sit with him on a stream together in a meeting and we can finish a whole environment in under an hour while he just looks at it go do this do, do that and i like tweaking and adjusting on the spot and then i do a bake afterwards uh, that's how quickly i work uh, with my art director but that's also because he gives me his time. I'm very lucky when it comes to my art director. He sits down and goes through everything very quickly. Does that make sense? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, that's no, interesting to hear. I agree with well, that. How do you work with your art director so far? How's your experience uh, early on? Yeah, I find that um, the physical base lighting does help a lot to get like consistency to, to the whole game. Um, but then also, like you were saying, at the end of the day, you are working on a game and while it'd be wonderful to use these uh, physical based values for lighting for the whole thing and all the lights having proper like realistic fall off and all this nice lovely stuff like not always the case in, in game development sometimes you have to optimize and that's where a little bit of uh, fakery comes in and you know filling in certain areas and faking the gi and all that kind of stuff so uh, i think it's good to have an understanding of physical based like, lighting systems and use it maybe as like a baseline but it's also really uh helpful to know what you're trying to achieve and how to go about sort of fake it like you said that you do a bit of painting um i think that helps a lot in when you're doing painting you're trying to figure out like oh, i want like this certain color here and that color there and i want to sort of maybe have a bit more than you would see in perhaps real life but you kind of push it to get the effect a bit more and you can kind of do that with your lighting as well so it's it's good to have a knowledge of both i think to, to know when to start faking it how far to push it have you had the opportunity to use lumens yet in unreal engine 5. i've used it a little bit yeah like i, I want to use more of unreal engine 5 but it's, it's just finding the time for it but yeah for my uh, personal work i've been using it quite a bit and i, I absolutely love it it makes things so much like quicker and easier to do um though i have found that sometimes on like a smaller level it could be a bit more difficult to get some of these like micro shadows that you be used to getting in like a kind of bait lighting workflow. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot of stuff I can like tweak to go and achieve that. But it's incredible what you can achieve with it. It's such like a it's like a real time thing, you know. It's... And what are your thoughts about lumens though? Like from a from an early learning point of view, do you think if a new lighting artist is learning lighting and they pick up lumens, are they gonna have the same skill set and understanding as someone who has to learn it the, a bit more old school, manual type of way and train their mm -hmm. eyes to understand where is it too much, where is it too little and controlling it? Because lumens does take away that control in a sense. A lot of people speak about lumens as uh, it makes things easier, it's more fun, but you're letting the technology and the math do a lot of artistic lighting and you have to kind of override it afterwards to yeah. get control of it versus the old method if you do it 
the really old method is like you place every light everywhere uh, you have to teach your eyes to know where it's too dark too bright where you need to feel light and i'm talking about that old method that you would learn like 10 15 years ago basically what do what's your thought about that like do you think it's a yeah. pro or a con um i think overall it's a pro like i kind of see what you're sort of getting at a bit there and maybe it could make certain uh, new artists coming into it a bit sort of um less familiar less experienced or just slightly like lazier maybe with how they approach their lighting with not having to like, know every single little bit about it and having the engine do a lot of the work for you um, but i think actually at the end of the day that's really a good thing and it'll just speed things up across the board and in terms of getting the effective lighting results well you know if you're a, a talented artist and you've done the research and you've looked elsewhere maybe outside of games you've like like painting and film and stuff like that and you've learned about all of, all of that that'll be applied to what you're doing anyway so yeah it, it might make you a bit lazier but i think overall it is is a good thing definitely it's going to be a speed things up like so much more and uh hopefully it won't end up with everything just like looking the same because you know no one's sort of experimenting with different things i think that's my only slight concern with it that things might look even more familiar because um, i know that there's something i read the other day about a lot of games looking kind of familiar because they use a similar kind of like aces like tone mapping and it can make things look quite similar so, i think with lumens uh, what's going to happen it's going to have the same comment as 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 unity had in the beginning where the, you could tell it was just the same type of lighting and the same kind of look and i think with mm -hmm. lumens because if you do allow lumens to do a lot of the work it's going to be a lot of the same look and i think you can separate a good lighting artist probably easier now because i think most artists will be able to make something look good now without really understanding it but mm -hmm. Then you have the lighting artists preferably and hopefully they can look at it and go okay that's not actually how it should be and, and i can push it even further with the different mood different color and actually tweak the the, the distance the, the the shadows a bit differently to get it to be more closer to what i want because uh, at the moment what people are doing they just add the light they push it up they fix the exposure and it looks good but you know you want to be an artist too and um, that's kind of where lumens hopefully is going to help people to be more of an artist um but hopefully it doesn't make them lazy as you say in the sense that they skip the process and they're just happy with the default setting because it's kind of like a drop and drag and drop kind of lighting in some cases and people think that's uh, enough which mm -hmm. they also thought before with ray tracing and they thought that before with baking you just put the light and you bake and, and it's enough but it's I think that's interesting for me to see at least uh, when I see a difference in, in people who are doing the lumens work and how quickly they're doing it and the quality of it. I'm a bit more um, skeptical in, in, in if they're skipping the foundational skills because you don't have to pay attention to it. Um, so during my course, I make sure you do the baking first um, to kind of learn the basics uh, before you do anything else, basically. But it's exciting times, though, isn't it? So. Oh, absolutely. Are you allowed to talk about the project you're working on? Uh, unfortunately, not. Wish I could, no. but yeah, unfortunately, I can't. But I did have um, a question actually. I was wanting to ask you that I'd also like to expand upon after you've said uh, your point on it. But when you're looking for inspiration for lighting, where where do you usually go for your inspiration for sort of different scenes or even like work stuff? So normally, when I need inspiration. Uh, it depends. Sometimes I wake up early uh, during dawn and dusk and I go out and have a walk sometimes with the camera and I'll look at the spot and go, that's interesting. And I'll take the camera and I have an overexposed and underexposed to see how it looks like with the camera. Because sometimes things look like boring with my eyes. So I use mm -hmm. the camera to kind of compensate with it. So there might be just a couple of weeks ago, I was having a walk and I saw this nice warm light coming on. It was, you know, it was nice enough for me to spot but it wasn't like compositionally wise and everything wasn't good so I thought, okay if i take the camera place it a different thing 
underexposed, you get the contrast out. And I thought that's a nice shot with the with the bus stop and the person standing there, and it's all just kind of like yeah. your background image here in the in the brutalist. It's got this nice light coming in, you know, and just it was just framed very nice. So that's one active way of doing it and training both your photography, but also how things work and transferring over. Uh, yeah. Another way is obviously. Um, depends sometimes i i look at uh, graphics novels and with like color and everything i think that's kind of interesting because i like the style i do get a lot of inspiration from anime as well uh mm. certain anime certain cartoons i find interesting the stylized type of look uh, such as arcane or the dota and all those things that's out and going i think that's interesting um movies tv shows the common things like that uh i will also sometimes buy the art books for different games and stuff and i'll collect them and i'll go through them and go okay that's interesting to look at and concept art websites tends to be it can be behind our station pinterest uh shot tag specifically for for movie references and, and tv show references uh but it costs money now um uh and very often i think and i think that's for most people if you're sitting and watching a little bit and um a tv show or something you see a shot and you go, oh that's an interesting shot and you go like Oof. so that's like a very good way is just to casually watch stuff and then go oh, that's a good shot and yeah i'm always of... like screenshotting stuff you're like oh that's really cool like so what software do you use to screenshot uh i use green shot for screenshotting actually because it's just easy to like draw and copy and paste and just sort of sense of over and yeah that's what i usually use yeah. although i think like netflix has started doing a thing where you like can't screenshot like netflix it like goes like black which is a bit annoying um, but... yeah i i know a couple of people who know a software that overwrites it so you can still take your screenshot i forgot what it was but i asked the same question to some of my students they knew how to do it there's three different software apparently that allows you to take the screenshot on all the streaming media and i think it's okay as long as you do for referencing it's kind of annoying that netflix is stopping you to get a reference innocent reference since uh yeah yeah it is it's a bit of a shame but um yeah it's interesting what you're saying about all the different ways you can get inspiration um for me i, I definitely really enjoy going out and uh like photography one that you mentioned that's like a quite a key one for myself um, but also just while i'm going out and doing a bit of photography and with the environment around me i quite like to sort of uh take in how does it all make me feel like if i'm in a particular place at a particular time like what does it make me feel a bit different because it's you know like late in the evening or early in the morning or you know what what kind of things are going on there that could affect my like my mood because that's what i'm really interested in with lighting is uh using it to convey mood and ambience so i always think about that whenever i'm going around going like hikes or just going out and about so i really like to try and get out as much as possible and i'll still get some reference from you know the video games and like you say netflix and things like that but i like to try and get a lot from just being out and about in, in the world and going like big walks and like traveling a bit as well just seeing how different areas are lit in different ways and kind of sometimes making little mental notes or even like writing stuff down about where i am and like why does this particular place at this particular time feel so different or look so different and what what's going on here and how could i maybe even emulate that in in a game environment makes sense i mean i have a piece in my portfolio where it's like uh, it's just a woman sitting uh, in a in a room, so to speak, um, that happened basically because of a feeling of being alone when I was traveling. I'll show you the piece. I don't know if you've seen it before, uh, and it's interesting to hear you talk about it. Uh, sounds cool. So I had this piece, um, and I, I'm putting out because you said feeling and thoughts. Mm. Uh, and I thought, okay, do I have something that where I was? At? So this one was like um, a feeling and thought of because I was uh, had moved to uh, uh, France to work at Ubisoft a little bit, and France is not the most um, easiest place to live and, and be when you don't speak the language. Yeah, yeah. So I was quite alone and, and uh, kind of like dealing with it. So I was feeling alone and. So I, I made a piece that represented my thoughts and feelings without really telling everyone that I was alone and I'm having a difficult mm. time. So I looked for pieces that uh, had that feeling of being alone and you're traveling and you're like in the vast empty space. 
Uh, and then I remember Alien Isolation is one of my favorite uh, games when it comes to well, this type of game, but also the mood. Um, so I made like a piece that kind of represented that that same feeling and emotion, basically, but my way of doing it. So that's like a good example. I don't know if you have any of your pieces that you know f that is like based on an emotion or a feeling or a time of space and time. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, yeah, I really like that one that you've done there. That's cool that you sort of uh, channeled your sort of emotions into that piece. Definitely a very sort of like artistic way of, of approaching it. Um, yeah, let me have a little look at my stuff. I don't, off the top of my head, I tend to just go off stuff that like I really like a certain look that I'm going for. And in terms of like mood and feeling, I find that with, um, let me just get this off here. I find that listening to music really helps inspire me in like certain moods to go for in whatever I'm working on. Um, I suppose actually the relight I did here, I'll uh, share this screen with you. Hey. Oh, it's back already. Did it for me. Look at that. Um, so yeah, this particular piece I did was just like a kind of relight of this like mountain area and uh, like a kind of sunset. And I did this based on uh, when I was in Canada and like just how beautiful it was being out there. And I was living in the middle of uh, Banff National Park in Alberta. And it was just a very different way of living because before that I'd been living in like big cities like, like Sheffield and wherever else in the UK. And so coming out here and living in like a tiny little mountain town was a very different way of living. And uh, it was just really beautiful being out there with, with nature. And I was trying to encapsulate some of that in this piece that I did. And uh, yeah, to remember these real like peachy kind of sunsets that you'd get over in the mountains, in the Rocky Mountains there. So I was trying to, yeah, capture some of those colors with it. But That's cool, man. Oh. It is it does take a bit to capture a moment and I, that's why i think it's good to at least have a camera and expose it very quickly the way you see it so you can kind of go back home and kind of capture the feeling but the music part is definitely interesting it's not something i do but i do know when i listen to music and i walk somewhere my walking style changes to the music mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm like feeling different and walk differently that's definitely a case uh, there yeah um, exactly so i kind of get that with like the way i work as well and depending on like what artists or kind of genre of music i'm listening to will kind of change maybe how i'm working and sort of certain things i push in whatever piece i'm going for i've noticed so if everyone is keen to learning these things i just want to point out uh lighting bot has a, a courses at courses.lightingbot.com for you to uh, learn it's a quick uh, intro if anyone is keen to learning that if that was useful, you should head over to courses.lightingbot.com and consider some of the courses and mentorship. You'll be able to learn all of these things, fundamental of lighting, incorrect materials, exposure, EV, how to use volumetrics, how to deal with light bidding, how to do post-process grading, emissive, how to do fill light and extra lighting, different times of day, how you do it differently for the each day using EV, how to go away from the EV and technical lighting to do artistic lighting, understanding curves, analyzing painting, how it affects your art and lighting, how to train your eye and how to learn from painting, uh, candle principle, Pocunia effect, game optimization, the danger of fog that a lot of people don't understand and lots more. Again, we have had people go through the course and get work. We have some testimonial you can check little bit about myself my co-author Sander who has been uh, going through the content and improving the content as well he's a technical lighting artist so more technical than myself uh, and you can check all the content that's being added uh, on a regular basis fundamental stuff advanced stuff technical stuff and we're still adding new content because when John students join they have an ability to ask for uh, some learning basically you can also upgrade to a month month mental um, monthly mentorship you get some extra stuff for discount price and you have me and, and other mentors if you upgrade to five months you can have an opportunity to get some career roadmaps or different offers if you want a very specific offer just you know 
talk to me and I'll uh, schedule something specific for you as well. Okay, a great opportunity to learn. Cool. All right. Um, that was interesting. You're saying that video you just played there about the dangers of using fog. I've definitely found that myself in certain scenes where it can be so powerful that it can also like really wash out the scene and kind of remove some of the contrast. So it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's not something a lot of people talk about already. And uh, yeah, it's just something for people to know about at least. We have come to the end of this session. I have been able to get a couple of extra minutes out of George, luckily. And he hasn't noticed that. <laughs> it's really? been an hour already. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. So I do want to thank you for your time, George. I will talk to you a little bit after the end broadcast. Don't leave yet. But for the, everyone else that's watching, thank you so much for being uh, Shadow Watchers, Ninja Watchers. Stop Ninja Watching. Please like and subscribe and help us out and yeah thank you for engaging click the discord link in the description if you want to join the community i will try and arrange a lighting challenge in the future and or as usual uh, please remember we do do portfolio reviews so come by the server ask for it and do it every few months uh, if you want to learn more about lighting the games get you know talk to me and please there are countless of other interviews from majority of the industry people the, when they started out, people who have already been around for a while, there's no one who's not important for me. I catch you, I find you, I'll ask you to join. Um, it's really up to you. So if you know someone who suits the talk, be it an uh, art director, concept artist, uh, actual photographer, could be an interior designer, I don't really care. I can connect it to lighting, so just let me know if you know someone. I do need help finding people. It is such a time sink, and it's not that easy. And as George knows, there's a lot of back and forth trying to make it work <laughs> as well. So I, yeah. I appreciate any help I can get. So George, do you have any final words? Um, Wes, thank you so much for having me on here. This has been great. And like I was saying earlier on, yeah, this is a really valuable resource. So it uh, means a lot that you're trying to pull this together because I know it's a tremendous amount of work that must go into uh, collating all this stuff together. And yeah, I, I really appreciate that, helping myself and others get into lighting art. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you for having me on here and to everyone that's come and joined us today. Yeah, no problem. I'll uh, spam your uh, art station in the chat here. And uh... Yeah, feel free. That's something, actually, if anyone wants to reach out and ask me any questions, lighting-related or anything else, you know, photogrammetry, material art, whatever else it is, um, feel free to reach out to me on my art station or LinkedIn. And, yeah, we'll, I'll talk a little bit with George now and uh, kind of get the closure feedback. And everyone else, have a nice weekend and uh yes uh thank you see you again uh, next week remember we have a session uh we have a new talk already scheduled for next week which is uh let's see if you're on the discord channel you would know we're talking to ellis um she her road to junior lighting artist so it's very relevant for new people as well uh she's quite new as well but it's always nice to get some fresh take on how she got her work and got into a turbulent on, on star citizens and stuff like that so again i don't care if you're famous or not i just care that you have something to share and if you're nervous i'll make you unnervous don't worry about that so thank you again everyone so see you guys around